Everyone, welcome back to another video. So in this review, I'm gonna be covering the BMAX B4 Pro. This is a new mini PC from BMAX. It's a relatively new company. Now they're the ones that made the BMAX Y13, one of my favorite Gemini Lake laptops. And this turns out to be a fantastic, I think, little mini PC that supports up to three displays. So it is powered by the Whiskey Lake U. This is the Core i3 8145U. It has dual cores, four threads, maximum turbo is 3.9 gigahertz. We get plenty of expansion options with this. It can take either SATA 3, NVMe as the main drive, but we can also install and change the wireless, which is good, and even add more RAM. So there were a couple of surprises there. Overall, I think this was probably one of the better mini PCs that I have looked at recently, as you'll find out in this in-depth review. So this is what we get inside the box. An HDMI cable, we get the power adapter, which is 12 volts, three amps, and two plugs that you can clip into it. So one's for US, one for Euro right here, a Visa mount, and they also do give us a quick start guide. So on the top of the B4 Pro here, we've got the BMAX logo and that what looks like an Autobots or Decepticons Transformer ripoff logo and the Intel inside. So this material on the top, this is plastic for the wireless antenna reception, of course. So the frame around the outside is made out of an alloy here and we've got two USB 3 ports. We have Type-C, now this is USB 3.1 spec. So yes, it does actually support video out. You can run three monitors in total with this mini PC here, which is definitely one of the key selling points of it. And a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack with microphone support. So there's no mic on board this, but it does apparently have speakers, which I will test out later on. And then of course the power button, which does have a status LED behind it. On the left, we have a little slot here for our micro SD cards. So this is good. They sit right in flush and an intake, you could say vent there as well on the side and another vent below it. And then on the back from the left to the right, I'll go here. We've got a reset switch there. So if you end up messing up the BIOS settings or you need to reset it, then you just push through like a paper clip to reset there. Display port, mini display port, this one. So that supports 4K 60 frames per second. Then we have an HDMI 2.0A. So again, 4K 60, which is great, 60 Hertz. Two USB 2 ports and then a gigabit LAN and then our DC in there for powering this, of course, with the 12 volts, three amps. On the right, we just have an exit vent. So this is where the hot air comes out and you get a bit of fan noise, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the review. And finally, on the bottom of the B4 Pro here, this is where you'll find four rubber feet. We've got the two screw mounts there for the Visa bracket. And if you want to get inside this, which I will do, of course, I'll show you the internals. We need to pry off these four little rubber feet because there are four screws behind them. So there are some pleasant surprises in here. I expected only a single sodium slot, but no, we have two. So this one comes pre-configured with eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. And this is 2,666 megahertz that it's running at. And I can see that the timings on here, cast latency is 19, 19, 19. So it's not exactly the fastest RAM. So I could add an additional eight gigabytes to make it dual channel 16 to really boost my performance, uh, which I may do later on in this review. And right here, we've got upgradability of adding a M.2 SATA 3 2242 SSD in here. Now, the largest size I have of those is 512 gigabytes. I don't believe you can actually get any bigger than that, but we do have right here an NVMe SSD 256 gigabytes. Below it, I will show you just in a second, is actually a wireless LAN card that we can upgrade as well. So if you want to put in better wireless, faster wireless, say wireless AC, uh, the 9120, which I do recommend, that's up to gigabit wireless, in fact, over, is very good. And it also has Bluetooth 5, we're able to do that. They've got a big heat sink that you can see on top of that NVMe SSD, which is good. One strange thing is that we've got room here for a SATA 3, 2.5 inch SSD or hard drive, but they haven't given us the SATA cable for it. In fact, I cannot see any plugs on the motherboard for it. So it looks like we're out of luck there. Now, if you look closely right here, we do actually have a plug there that is labeled SATA connection. It says connection one, but why have they not included the plug? I think because really there isn't much room to fit that plug in there. It will be very difficult. So hopefully in other models, they will actually include that cable for us because it would be great to be able to take advantage of that space it has there for the 2.5 inch drive. 
So overall, this has a very good build quality. It's excellent. I like the way they've laid things out and great that we have that additional free slot to add dual channel RAM or upgrade to even 32 gigabytes if you wanted to. Now I will quickly just show you a few things here in the buyer. So it is almost completely unlocked to us. So under the advanced setting, there's one important feature here. If you plan to use this as a little, for example, file server or a server, you need it to reboot or boot itself after power loss, go into power management right here, find restore on AC power loss, turn that on. So that means it will resume. And it's really a handy feature to have if you're gonna be using this as a little server that is. So a lot of settings in here aren't really that relevant. Now there is an overclocking performance menu, but not really much can be done with this one right here. You can enable that and there are settings there for our memory, but the memory doesn't seem to want to run any faster than 2.4 gigahertz uh, with this particular chipset here. Under CPU configuration, we don't have any options, sadly, for power limits. So you might be able to increase that to say 25 watts or more, but you'll be able to use Intel's extreme tuning utility for tweaking that or undervolting if you wanted to do that. A few other settings there as you can see. And then of course our boot order. So let's jump into Windows now. So when you first boot it up, we do have the following pre-installed language pack. So we've got English, German, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, Korean, Russian. So let's have a look at the device manager here. There's just a few things I wanted to point out. So we've got Intel Wireless AC, the 9462, as I showed you when we looked at the internals, you can upgrade this and put a much better wireless uh, card in there because this one's only about 390 megabits per second throughput maximum, which isn't great. And then the processor, so it is the Whiskey Lake. And okay, the Core i3-8145U isn't actually too bad. So it's dual core four threads, the maximum turbo is 3.9 gigahertz. So it's not like they crippled it with some of the other Core i3s that actually had no turbo or basically wouldn't turbo only about 200 megahertz more or something like that, but not with this particular one here. So this is the SSD. I have no idea what kind of brand this is without actually getting right into it, but it was sealed up pretty well with that clip around it and the heat sink. The speeds, as you can see here, they are not the fastest for an NVMe drive, but this is still pretty good. I mean, it's a lot faster, over double the speed you would get with SATA 3 SSD. And remember, you can add another one in there if you wanted to upgrade on storage. So I did test out that Type-C port, and yes, 4K, 60 hertz out of that one, which is really good, and very fast transfer speeds. And the same goes for the HDMI 2 port that it is also running, 4K, 60 hertz, and our mini display port out as well. Now you can run three monitors all at the same time, but you won't be able to get 60 hertz 4K out of all three of them. No, you'll probably be limited to 30 on some of them. So just bear that in mind there too. But it's good that we can run the four, sorry, three displays at least with this. You don't often see that with mini PCs. And then, okay, that micro SD card slot, not super quick, it will max out about 30 megabytes per second reads and writes. So the version of Windows they have installed is Windows 10 Pro, it's 1903 of course, run Windows updates to get all the latest updates and fixes to come through. And here is that memory of course just running currently in single channel. So the maximum speed of 2.4 gigahertz is all that the chipset supports even though that RAM that they give us is 2.66 gigahertz. So let's take a look at performance. The start menu pops up very quick. This thing runs really fast and I've got Kodi open right here. So this is an excellent media machine here. So if you had this hooked up to a 4K TV, because of the HDMI 2 support, you're gonna get that 60 hertz, 60 frames per second. So this is a Sony Swordsmith HDR 4K file here. Now HDR support, I can't seem to get it with the drivers. It doesn't seem to work here, but this is running flawless, a super demanding file. I think it's 170 megabits per second as well, 60 frames per second 4K. Really, really good. That is of course with Kodi. And other files will play back flawlessly. So this right here is Geekbench 5. Now I decided to also test it running dual channel configuration. So dual channel RAM with two sticks in there and actually up to 32 gigabytes runs fine, no problems here. You can see that is the score dual channel, single channel, this is Geekbench 4 by the way and you do get quite a bit of an increase there, even to the single core score, I think because of better RAM timings there. And this is Geekbench 5. So these scores are kind of low, but the single core score is actually not too bad here with this one. So that was with the default 
8 gigabytes of RAM, and here with it running in dual channel RAM, a nice little boost there. So I do have Chrome open here, just wanted to show you that you can swap between tabs here, and this is very quick, no problems at all. I mean, for this kind of use and office use documents I do have here, I've got a massive, huge amount of pages here, so 859, and it is really, really quick. So this is very good performance for this, and spreadsheets as well, no problems. Able to handle this with ease. Nothing like the Gemini Lake CPUs that I've been reviewing and some of the Cry 5s and older kind of stuff. This is actually very good for just a dual core little mini PC. Really good performance. And even, yes, editing video. So I've got 4K here that I'm editing in Adobe Premiere Pro. This is the latest version. And you see when I scrub a heat here, it's not too bad. Now one tip, if you're gonna be editing 4K video on this, you definitely want dual channel RAM. So I recommend adding another stick of eight gigabytes. Definitely if you plan to get the best out of this. And if you stick this on full, this is to do with the preview here. It's a little slower, but actually not too bad. Now export times are not wonderful because of the dual cores. Now it does support the hardware exporting. So that's using Intel's QuickSync, but looking at about Really, one minute of footage Footage is going to take three minutes, three and a half minutes. So it's, yeah, a little bit slow on that. But at least it can be done there, of course. I did run just a few other benchmarks as well. So Cinebench R15, just to quickly show you. 320 CB, yes, not impressive. That is, yeah, slow. And this is Cinebench R20, 609 points. So right down the bottom of their chart there because, well... Of the clock speeds, because of the dual cores there, not particularly fast. But overall, as a mini PC, for the spec, this one is running really, really good. Very smooth, very fast. So let's have a look now at some gaming performance. I'm going to run an FPS meter here, and we'll take a look at Counter-Strike Global Offensive at 1080p, or well, 720p, I think will be best. So even though I'm not playing, I just wanted to quickly show you this, that at 1080p on the lower settings, you can yeah. see it will scrape around 40, but it dips down, you can see then to 26. It's around 40, so you could call this playable only just, but I think 720p, which I'm gonna test now, is the best way to go with these games. Okay, so this is looking a lot better in 720p. 60 frames per second. Seems to be staying over it, which is what we want. Uh, my ping is not very good at all because I'm just on 4G, so there's gonna be a bit of lag probably showing up. Let's see how long I last here. Wait, well, I got a kill, but died straight away. Okay, so now on to Thermal, so 43 minutes of me pushing it very hard, benchmarking, I did a little bit of gaming as well, and you see maximum temperatures, 88 degrees on the package and on the CPU, and well, 89 is our maximum overall there, which is okay, because it's not actually triggering any thermal throttling, which is the good thing. It does trigger power limit throttling, and if you have a look at the power limits, what they have set, so the power limit one, so PL1, is 15 watts, and then power limit two is 18.75. Now, in theory, you could actually set a T TDP up of 25 watts with this particular chip, but I can see already that I don't think the cooling is going to be able to handle it. Now, if you use Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, you could up this. You could even undervolt a little bit as well to help the temperatures and boost performance, but I don't really recommend messing around with that power limit, considering I'm already seeing... 89 degrees. We don't really want it to get much hotter than that, but at least there is no thermal throttling. Maximum turbos, you can see, did hit that 3.9 gigahertz. So I'll give you a sample of the fan noise that it's not actually that loud. I don't find it too offensive. My desktop PC is making more noise than this, but here is it at 100% load benchmarking it. Now one thing I haven't shown you is Linux support, but I did test out a Linux Mint pen drive that I have and it works just fine, okay? No problems, everything is working there. Of course, this being not a laptop, we don't have to worry about things like audio volume controls, screen brightness controls and stuff like that. So it was fine, no touchpad, of course. So no problems there running Linux. Now I like the fact that it does have in the BIOS settings, quite a few settings that we're able to tweak on there. There's no power limit one there. Not that you want to mess with power limits. That's probably why they haven't enabled it for us. So you can set it to auto reboot, 
once it loses power. So it detects that it's lost the power state and power comes back on, it'll reboot. And that is perfect, of course, for server use if you wanted to put it on a switch. However, for server use, if you're gonna be pushing it very hard all the time, if you're gonna use it as a web server that's gonna be handling a lot of big websites or heavy websites with a lot of traffic, then this thing will heat up. It will get quite warm. I've noticed physically to the touch, it's getting up to about 48 degrees. Now it gets up to 88 degrees with the cooler in there. Fan noise is very acceptable for me. I don't think most people are gonna find it to be too much of an issue. It's not screaming away. It's not an offensive loud noise or anything like that, but it is there and it can be heard. But when you're doing idle kind of tasks, just light use, for example, watching a movie, you're in Chrome or something with about 10 tabs open, this is very quiet. You have to put your ear up to it to actually hear it is working there, which is a good thing. So the idle temperatures will be around the mid 60s, 50 sometimes depending on your climate. Ambient temperatures right now are about 26 degrees where I am, so that's why I'm getting up to about 88. And it doesn't didn't trigger any thermal throttling, which is another good point there. You can run the three displays, and very surprising to see that it does have Type-C with 4K 60 hertz output maximum, and very fast speeds from that USB 3.1 spec drive, uh, sorry, port there it has on the front, which is really good. So what is it missing? Just a microphone, really. That's really it. It does sell for 369 US dollars, which I think is actually acceptable. You could say that that's too expensive for what it is, but factor in that it does have the NVMe drive, which is quite quick. I mean, it's not the fastest I've seen for NVMe, but we also have expandability in here. But the con, why is there no SATA cable or screws to put a 2.5 inch drive in here, which would have been brilliant. That would have been perfect if they'd given us that, because that means we could put, say, a four terabyte or two terabyte spindle hard drive in here for all your media files and movies and things like that, and that would be cheaper, higher capacity storage, of course, but we do have expandability with the 2242 millimeter size drive that we're able to add. So, overall, really do like this. Is it recommended from me? Yes, definitely. I think it is a good little mini PC. Now, I will be reviewing the Nisvin, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Core i7. 8565U Whiskey Lake will be in the channel in probably about a week's time if you want to see more mini PC reviews. So do stay tuned for that. And thank you so much for watching this review. Bye for now.